Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to be getting into lesson nine, or I'm sorry, lesson ten this evening, the doctrine of church fellowship. But before that, uh, we have the worksheet for lesson nine, and let's take a couple of minutes here to go through that. So, starting with question number one of the multiple choice, the Holy Christian Church is the sum total of all believers in Jesus as their Savior. Number two, members of the Holy Christian Church are called saints because, you got it, Lana? They have been cleansed of their sins through Jesus. Good job. Wasn't sure if you had turned to it yet or not. Uh, three, members of the Holy Christian Church will always be found in Christian congregations, wherever the Bible and the sacraments are used. Four, if a person is a true believer in Jesus as his or her Savior, he or she will always be a part of a Christian congregation unless it is physically impossible. Five, people who join a congregation but who do not rely on Jesus as Savior are not really a part of the church at all but only appear to be. Six, the plain truth about congregations is that they are designed by God to be blessings for believers. Seven, the ministry of Christ's body is the privilege and responsibility of all believers, all people in the congregation. Yeah. Eight, the pastor's function in a congregation is to equip and train the believers to carry out their ministry well. Nine, excommunication refers to the work of believers when they remove from membership those who are sinning and not repenting. Ten, each believer should remember that each day he or she is representing and serving Christ, that God be praised by all. And eleven, sharing the gospel with other people is the duty of all believers who have opportunities to do so each day at work, school, and home. Good. Any questions on those? Did well. Yeah. All right, true and false. Now, when we speak of saints, we refer only to very famous Christians who have died. False. It is all right to join a non-Christian church if it is close to our home. False. True believers are to be found in all parts of the world. Uh, I, I do have true here. Does anybody wish to uh, contend that at all? Because maybe somebody might be thinking like Saudi Arabia, uh, where, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so safe to be a Christian, but you might find small pockets of Christians here and there scattered throughout. But, <clears throat> yeah. Basically, that, that one is true. True believers will always want to be a part of a Christian congregation. That's true. Uh, to be a true member of the Holy Christian Church, one must trust Jesus as Savior. True. Every believer is a saint in the eyes of God. True. All congregations should be centered in the Bible and the sacraments. True. God wants all different kinds of visible churches with different kinds of teachings? No, uh, but that is the reality, not that we're going against God, though, when we do that. Um, a church that is faithful and loving will never have any divisions. False. A Christian can disregard the unloving actions of a congregation as long as the congregation is faithful to the Bible. False. Church discipline is to be done in love, not in hate or revenge. True. Public ministry means that everyone knows all the work a pastor does. False. Only the pastor has been given the locking and unlocking keys. False. The keys open and close the door to heaven by locking or unlocking the forgiveness of sins. True. Heaven is open to anyone who sincerely believes in any God. False. God put pastors in the church for the sake of good order. True. If someone sins publicly, the first thing we should do is tell the pastor, false. We cannot warn another person about his sin unless our sins are smaller, false. When we speak to someone about his or her sins, we should admit that we too are sinful, true. Sorrow for sin should be followed by an attempt to undo the harm we caused, true. And coming back to church after excommunication is a long and difficult process. False. Any questions on those? I, I have not a question, but it's more or less like what did it mean? So 
uh, a Christian can disregard the unloving actions of a congregation as long as the congregation is faithful to the Bible? Yep. What? So I marked it as false. But yep. what, did, what did you mean? What does that mean? Because if, if I don't agree with something that the church or congregation is doing, why couldn't I just leave? That, and that's exactly the point. That, that you would have the right to leave. Oh, okay. I mean, ultimately, you would want to try to uh, help the congregation resolve the issue, you know, address it with the pastor or church leadership, uh, not just cut tail and, or cut ties and run away. But um, you would, if they, if they are making it clear that they have no desire to address the issue, and it is a very legit issue, um, there, there might be some grounds there. Yeah, to leave. So, yeah, a Christian can disregard the loving actions of a congregation. No, no, don't disregard that. Um, it, they need to be addressed. Okay. Yeah, so, you're on. You're correct. I just, they're wrong, I think. Yeah. Okay, um, we'll, uh, we'll open our lesson then with prayer. Lord of the Church, thank you once again for gathering us together uh, to study your word. Uh, give us an appreciation and an understanding of this complex topic that we are talking about tonight that uh, is often overlooked or um, under-taught or even under-explained in a lot of, of churches today. Um, give us that understanding so that we might uh, grow and benefit from it and see your loving intent in it, the doctrine of church fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, I've got a bunch of opening paragraphs there, uh, maybe a little bit more explanatory in nature. Uh, first of all, we start off with some quotes. Pastor, why can't my friend who belongs to the non denominational church down the road sing a solo at my wedding? Pastor, my sister, who belongs to the ELCA church in town, was very upset that she wasn't allowed to come to communion today. Pastor, why doesn't our church support the Boy or Girl Scouts? Some of these statements might sound very familiar or even resonate with you. Every Wells pastor has encountered each of these comments and others like them throughout their ministries. And because these comments accurately, albeit in a limited way, reflect our doctrine and practice, the Wells is often viewed as a bunch of stuck-up, conceited, holier-than-thou Christians. It all has to do with the Bible teaching we call the Doctrine of Church Fellowship. Now, the Doctrine of Church Fellowship is one of the least taught and, consequently, least understood doctrines of the Bible among most Christian denominations today. Even among our own membership, this special Bible doctrine isn't well understood. As a result, sincere Christians are left confused and frustrated. Because of this, many people think that the doctrine of church fellowship is a Wells invention, not to be found in the Bible. However, the doctrine of church fellowship can be found all over the pages of Scripture, and God has a loving intention with this doctrine that is designed to protect us and bring blessings into our lives. The principles of the doctrine of church fellowship are clear. The application of those principles to specific situations can be challenging at times. However, if we can understand the principles, it will help mitigate or even spare us from future frustration. So to start things off, uh, good for us to define terms. What is fellowship? Uh, basically, in, at its heart, fellowship is unity. If you want a longer definition, it's friendly relationships between people and the activities in which they work together to advance their common goals. Now, there are different aspects to fellowship um, that we could talk about, and some of them we'll briefly cover here. Uh, one of them will dominate our lesson for tonight. But uh, in a broad sense, there is what's called Christian fellowship. And this is the spiritual relationship or unity that we have with God through faith in Christ. Uh, but it's also, it also may refer, in a broad sense, to the spiritual ties that we have with all believers as members of the invisible church, the Holy Christian Church. Uh, so regardless of 
uh, what Christian denomination you might belong to. Um, in a sense, then, we, we all share this Christian fellowship, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Um, however, um, fellowship, as we're going to hear tonight, is, is not just a theoretical thing. It is something that is expressed as well. And it's expressed in three basic ways. The first one is uh, faith. And this is the spiritual fellowship, again, first of all, that all believers have with God and with each other through faith in Christ. <clears throat> but then getting a little bit more specific, the second one is confession, and that is the doctrinal fellowship that is recognized by a shared confession of the truth, so uh, by what people state that they believe. And then the third one, action, the fellowship that is expressed by joint activities. So doing uh, religious work together uh, is an expression of fellowship. So question number two then. Oh, sorry, jump the gun for somebody. Else. Hi, Sherry, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> Good. Good. Sorry, I'm late. No problem. I got here as soon as I could. Yeah. Sam no is sick. Oh. He uh, came home from school at noon. Mm. I just can't do it. Hopefully you feel better soon. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so question number three, or number two, of those three that we just looked at, faith, confession, and action, which one is hidden from our eyes and ears and is known only to God? Now, as I look at and evaluate another person, which one is hidden from us, from me? Spiritual fellowship? Yeah, the, the faith, number one. And why is that? Well, as we've learned previously, only God can look at the heart. <coughs> you know, we can hear another person's confession. We can see their actions. And maybe those things will give us a glimpse or an open window into what's going on in their hearts. But ultimately, it is God who knows what is in the heart. So then question number three, when we judge a person not to be in fellowship with us, or you know, when we, maybe a different word there, when we make a determination uh, that a person is not in fellowship with us, what are we not judging about that person? It's really the same answer, isn't it? We're, we're not judging their faith. And what are we judging? And why is it okay to make that judgment? You're judging their fruits. Yeah. And ultimately then, what, uh, by their fruit, you'll recognize, and that is their confession or doctrines, uh, their actions, their practice, or even both. Uh, in fact, that's a passage that we'll be coming to later on in this lesson. And we, we can test a person's confession of faith or their statement of belief to see if it matches uh, with the Bible. Same thing with their practice as well. And this can be a very helpful thing to, to lay this out and spell it out when we have to uh, practice one of the aspects of the Doctrine of Church Fellowship because it lets people know that, hey, we are not personally attacking you or judging what is most critical to you, to your faith. You know, only God can do that. But we can make a judgment about uh, the, the, the confession that you are holding to um, based on what you've either said or based on maybe even church membership potentially, and we'll talk about that later on tonight, or making a, you know, a, a judgment regarding people's actions. We make so, those sorts of judgments all the time in life. Uh, what is right and wrong? What is good and evil? Um, and there's nothing wrong with making those sorts of judgments. It's just we cannot judge a person's heart. And this then gets us into a much more narrow and defined scope of fellowship. Like I said, that's going to dominate our lesson tonight, and that is church fellowship. And that is the spiritual relationship or unity that we have and express with other Christian congregations and denominations, and even, you could say, Christian individuals as well. Now this sort of fellowship has a positive aspect to it 
and a negative aspect to it. Uh, for the positive aspect, we have a couple of passages here. Uh, the first one from 3 John, uh, those three verses. Indeed, I was overjoyed when brothers came and testified to your truthfulness, because you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than when I hear that my children are walking in the truth. Therefore, we have an obligation to support such men, so that we may be co-workers for the truth. So, uh, you know, God and his called workers are happy and excited when they hear that uh, his people are walking in the truth faithfully. But looking at verse 8 there, how does John define church fellowship? Like co-workers. Co-workers for what? The truth. The truth, yeah. And if you're going to be co-workers for the truth, you have to be on the same page, don't you? Because if one is um, advocating for the truth and another advocating for uh, you know something that's not true, even though they may think it's true, they can't be on the same page. It's just it, it's an irreconcilable difference. Uh, and then going a little bit further here, Psalm 133, verse 1. Lana? <coughs> Look how good and how pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. All right. So talking about uh, how, how good and pleasant, how wonderful this is. So to get to the question, it's listed as number five, but really it's number four. Um, according to the italicized portions of these passages, the positive aspect of church fellowship is that it is a good and pleasant setting where Christians are united in working together for the truth. Even when congregations are, two different church bodies, are 99% aligned, a lot of similarity, at some point down the road, even just that 1% is going to cause uh, some headaches and problems if you just pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, and you could really say that between the Wells and the Missouri Synod. We're almost, on paper, absolutely identical. The difference is, from one Sunday to the next in church, you would never even notice the difference. It's only behind the scenes, but those behind the scenes things uh, do have a significant impact on, on how uh, ministry is perceived, how uh, things are run, even in the case of Missouri Synod, uh, how it uh, limits their ability at times to practice church discipline uh, that we heard last week. And if you want to know more about that, I can get into that in a separate uh, issue, but um, outside of class. So that is the positive aspect of fellowship, that this is a working together for the truth, that this is, um, you know, we're, we're working towards something, something good. But there is also a negative aspect to this. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 4, Brad. <coughs> As I urged you while I was going to... Macedonia. Remain in... Ephesus. Ephesus. So that you may command certain men not to teach any different false doctrines or pay any attention to myths and endless... Genealogies. Genealogies that bring about aimless speculations rather than God's plan, which centers in faith. All right, a lot of big words there. But <laughs> notice Timothy's charge, what, what Paul was telling Timothy to do. Teach these men or command these men. Don't teach those different doctrines and the one that has been passed along to you. So telling them to stop it, knock it off. Next passage, 2 Corinthians 6. Shona. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what partnership does for what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? And what agreement does Christ have with Belial? <clears throat> or what does a believer share in common with an unbeliever? And what mutual agreement does God's temple have with idols? So, you know what a yoke is, not the stuff that you crack open and, and you fry on the pan in the morning. 
I know that's what you were going to probably say if I asked. <laughs> but <coughs> that wooden plank or beam that you spread across a, a couple of oxen, you know, working, uh, we're working together in tandem to, to keep them together to, so that way they're pulling in a united direction. Well, if you have two animals that are bent on going in separate directions, they, they can't be yoked together. Uh, it's just going to create more chaos. And in fact, typically what often happens in the case of the church is that if a church that's more faithful is yoked together with a church that is not as faithful, the more faithful one gets veered off of the truth over time. Um, and even scripture talks about the likelihood of that happening um, with some of the illustrations that it has for false doctrine, which uh, we'll hear later on. And some of you already got a sneak peek of from uh, those of you who got here early. <laughs> Next passage, Romans 16, Sherry. But I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the teaching that you learn. And keep away from them. All right, so just a, a quick caveat here. Paul's not saying that, okay, you can't have any association or connection with these people that you've got to cut off your friend base. That's not what he's talking about. I mean, if, if that were the case, well, we would have to leave this world. Um, what he's talking about here is expressions of religious fellowship and that gets us then to uh, number six here uh, according to the underlined portions of these passages the negative aspect of church fellowship is that christians will avoid any expression of fellowship or worship with anyone who teaches or believes false doctrine <coughs> That Christians will avoid any expression of fellowship or worship with anyone who teaches or believes false doctrine. You're probably wondering why there's a picture of a house up there. It's not just any house. That is my parents' house. It actually no longer looks like that. They just got siding on it over the summer. Uh, I haven't even been there in person yet to see the new siding. I've uh, seen pictures, but... That's the house I grew up in, in West Dallas, Wisconsin, a suburb of Milwaukee. Um, when I was growing up, down the block, so if you're looking at the house, um, you know, going to the west, uh, and across the street, there were two boys, and I mentioned them last week in passing, uh, Wabut and Michael. Um, and I, I'll tell you why I call them Wabut in a little bit. In fact, we got a Robert here tonight, my first time with a Robert in class. Wabut and Michael were two incredibly naughty boys. I mean, so my grade school, where I went K-6, to Roosevelt Elementary, was literally 50 yards from the house that direction, an old 1920s, you know, multi-story uh, public school building. Um, yeah, I lived, I lived closer to my school, grade school there than when I lived at the parsonage to here. That's how close it was. Uh, anyway, these guys, my, my grade school was the, uh, the dumping ground for the whole public school system in West Dallas, Milwaukee, where they dumped all of the ED and LD kids. That's what they labeled them back then. And they might even do that today. Emotionally disabled, learning disabled. So all the troubled kids were, were dumped into my school. Uh, we had a special resource teacher for them, Tim Doucette, awesome guy. Uh, Tough guy, didn't take any crap from kids. But these kids, Wabut and Michael, were so naughty that they couldn't even go there. <laughs> they had to go to a, a special school. So I don't even know where they went to school. So anyway, <clears throat> this was probably about the summer, uh, uh, the summer when I was going into second grade maybe or so. Uh, I have a sister who's a year and a half younger than me, and she was out behind the house on the playground, huge asphalt area. And she was riding her bike. She still had training wheels on and all that. And Wabut and Michael were chasing her. Now, it wasn't, you know, because they had a, a little boy crushes on her. They were chasing her with sharp shards of glass. And my sister, you know, she's frantically pedaling, looking over her shoulders, seeing where they are. The moment she turns tetherball pole, boom, goes uh, face over handlebar and psh, like that. And let me tell you, she looked like she fell face first down the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. It was not pretty. 
Now, I may not have been a good brother. In fact, I freely admitted and confessed and feel horrible about it that I was a pretty crappy brother at times. But I had a good big brother moment. Um, I went down to their house. I was fuming about this. Um, knocked on their door. And their house was right across the street from my sister's uh, best friend, Kathy, who was in between our ages, my sister Renee and I. Uh, right across the street from them, knocked on Wabut and Michael's door. Their mom answers, and I say, you know what your, your boys did to my sister? And she gets down in my face right here like this and says, and I quote verbatim, who gives a damn about your sister? Let me tell you, if it weren't for my sister's friend Kathy and then her older brother Steve, who was like four years older than me, standing across the street watching because they knew what was going on with my sister, uh, there was a, a nice uh, wad of spit in my mouth that was going to go projectile right into her face. I was so furious at what she said. But um, seeing them kind of brought me to my senses and I went home. But forever after, I had lost all respect for that woman. And... Um, she had this very, very, very raspy voice. Uh, it, either she gargled that glass that her kids were wielding, or she smoked three packs a day. I mean, man, did she have a singing voice. But quite often, you'd hear her yell throughout the neighborhood, Wabat, my tongue! And now you know where I get the Wabat from. And so because I had lost all respect for her, no matter where I was, what I was doing, whenever I heard her do that, yelling for her kids to come home or whatever, I would imitate her. And I could, believe me, I'm really good at imitations, or at least I used to be really good at imitating voices. I even almost got one of my classmates kicked out of class because I said something <laughs> said once in his voice. So uh, we used to be really good at it. <coughs> to this day, my mom still laughs about... Uh, my vocal imitation of uh, Wabut and Michael's mom. So, a little bit of background, first of all, on Wabut and Michael. Now we get to story number two. This one's even more interesting. So, this is the summer when I was heading into sixth grade, I believe. So, uh, summer of 1991. Uh, and, mind you, you guys know I, I'm not a tall guy. I'm five foot nine and a half, and I count that half inch because I need all the help I can get. <laughs> well, the height genes did not transfer to me. All the males on both sides of my family are over six feet. In fact, my dad, although he's the oldest of eight, he is the shortest of the four sons at six foot three. Back then, six foot three, pushing and maybe even past 220. So, good sized dude, all right? Well, my dad and I, we were out around the house in the backyard doing whatever at that moment. And my sister and her friend Kathy were on the front porch. Now, at that time, we didn't have a nice storm door like you see on there right now. It was this flimsy uh, screen door that uh, was <laughs> probably, a, I could have kicked it in at that time if I really wanted to. Well, they're playing, and I mean, you, you know girls, and they're playing and having fun. They, they scream, and that, that's just what girls do. They scream. Well, they started screaming. But this wasn't a normal scream. This was a help, I am terrified scream. My dad took off running around the side of the house. I was in close pursuit. As I get around to the front, there is Wabut. Wabut was a year older than me, Michael, a year behind me. But there's Wabut on the steps there with a knife cutting into the screen of the door to get at my sister and her friend. Well, my dad proceeds to take Waba and chuck him over his shoulders, and he lands on the sidewalk down there, or not, not the sidewalk, past the sidewalk, on the grass between the sidewalk and the street, on a fly. It was awesome. <laughs> you never bothered us after that again. Now, is what my dad did an act of love? Yes. Absolutely. He Why? He was protecting, protecting his, his daughter. Sister. Protection. Yeah. Protection means that sometimes others are not included. 
you know, we, we weren't going to be in, in that moment, uh, that uh, uh, the touchy-feely crowd, that, oh, wow, but we don't approve of what you're doing, but we don't really want to uh, cause any rift between us. No, you fire that guy off the <laughs> front steps <laughs> in, that, in that critical moment. Okay, um, it's not always what you have to do in, in every situation. Uh, obviously, there's a spectrum of danger, but <clears throat> this gets to the point with where we're at in number six, that... Sometimes people are not included. Sometimes you have to protect people, and in this case, protecting them from a false teaching. <coughs> Obviously, you're not going to fire them out of church like my dad fired them out of <laughs> Robert out of the uh, off of the steps. But um, the the point still being that there this is as what we see here, an act of love. And that gets us really then to the next point. Uh, what motivated God to give us the doctrine of church fellowship? And uh, we have 1 Timothy 3, or 1. Uh, we already read some of the passages here, but we're going to read the whole thing again and then tack on an additional verse. Um, I believe uh, we left off with, uh, is it you, Sherry? I think so. Okay, yep. <coughs> Oh, go ahead. First Timothy oh, 3. Oh, yes. with me. Oh, sorry. I thought, sorry. I, I thought I read something. Okay, my, my bad. <laughs> As I urged you while I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach any different doctrines or pay attention to myths and endless genealogies that bring about aimless speculations rather than God's plan, which centers in faith. The goal of this command is love. All right. And so, pretty self-explanatory there. The first blank to fill in for the question, what motivated God to give us this doctrine? He loves us. <coughs> Next passage, 1 Timothy 4, Brie. Pay close attention to yourself and to the doctrine. Preserve in them. Persevere. Persevere, sorry. Yep. Because by doing this, you will save both yourself and those who listen to you. Okay, so first of all, before you're, you're preaching to others, Timothy, pay close attention to yourself and what you're doing. Make sure you're, you're living as, as a God has called you to live. But then also pay attention that your teaching is the right thing. And then he says, persevere in these things, meaning doing it and holding on to it even when it is tough, even when it might cost something. And then you see in the bold there the reason for doing that, saving both yourself and those who listen to you. Um, before we get to the other two answers, though, let's take a look at 2 Peter 3, Robert. Therefore, <coughs> dear friends, since you already know these things, be on your guard so that you do not fall from your uh, own firm position in faith by being led astray through the error of the wicked. Okay, so again... Be on your guard so that you don't fall from your firm position because of the error of the wicked, that is, the, the false doctrine. And so what we see here then in these next two is that uh, he wants to give us pure doctrine to keep us strong in faith. And he wants to save us. I mean, think of it this way. Think of it as you got three glasses of water lined up in front of you. One just came fresh out of our nice reverse osmosis system. The next one, it's got a little bit of arsenic laced in with it. The next one, it's loaded down with a whole bunch of cyanide in it. Um, which one are you going to take? Obviously, you're going to take the, the option number one, right? You're not even going to think about the other options, regardless of whether or not option number two has a lethal amount, because you know it could, it's still not good for you. Reminds me of that scene from, uh, from ever see the Aaron Brockovich movie? You know, where uh, they, they bring in that, they say, oh, we just brought that water in for the, the uh, lawyers for the other legal team. We just brought it in from uh, whatever the place was where the water was contaminated, and they like didn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> um, it's the same idea here of what's going on with Dr. We're, we're not going to want to just say, okay, there, there are some things that we don't agree here, but we'll, we'll put up with it. 
And that gets us to this, this Peanuts cartoon with Linus and Lucy. Lucy, they're, they're both at the window, look outside, it's raining cats and dogs. And Lucy says, boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? And Linus very calmly and matter-of-factly said, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that it would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And then Lucy is looking quite relieved. She says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. And I've seen that before. You know, uh, talking actually about this very specific doctrine that we're going through tonight one time. Uh, I was over at a member's house at my previous call, and we were outside uh, sitting around a, a fire pit that they had put in their uh, driveway, and there were some family members of my members who were over who didn't belong to our church, and somehow we got on this subject, and they were uh, talking about some of their frustrations with this Bible teaching, and it gave me the opportunity to talk about it, and by the time we were done talking about it, you're like, you know, nobody's ever explained it to us that way before. That, that makes a lot of sense. You can see a lot of the, the anxiety and uh, frustration had just left them uh, after they, they got the explanation to the, the things that have been pressing their minds. So, um, good observation here by the writer of Peanuts. Question number two. Whom are we showing love for in practicing the doctrine of church fellowship? <clears throat> Multiple answers here. Our fellow Christians? All right, yep. Fellow Christians, that's option number three I have up on the screen. So if you want to write it down, you can get that going. Others? Ourselves. Ourselves, that's option number two. Jesus. God. There you go. <laughs> yes, God and his word ourselves, fellow Christians, and one more. Those who are in error. Because it's lovingly warning them about uh, the errors to which uh, they, they belong or they believe. Sometimes those two are not the same thing. sum that up for with everybody you you really could yeah i just wanted to emphasize <coughs> in uh <coughs> each of those groups so that way it's a consciously understood thing but yeah you could really sum it up with everyone all right part number three <coughs> how do we determine whether or not to have fellowship does God give me permission to have an express fellowship with anyone? Or should I have an express fellowship only with those who believe in Jesus? Or is that too broad a definition of fellowship? In this section, we're going to look at the biblical standard for fellowship and what the Bible has to say about how we determine whether or not to have fellowship. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Brothers, I am making an appeal to you using the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask that you all express the same view and not have any divisions among you, but that you be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So notice there, uh, a perfect unity of mind and thought. So to fill in the blank, according to the italicized portions in this passage, the biblical standard for people and churches to have religious fellowship with each other is a perfect, complete unity or agreement in all the doctrines of the Bible. There are some churches out there that have very low standards for fellowship. Uh, basically, they say, as long as you believe in the Trinity, uh, as long as you believe that Jesus died for your sins, uh, that's going to be enough to have fellowship. These other differences of, of Bible doctrine, that doesn't really matter. Um, but as we just heard here, and as other Bible passages tell us, that God's standard is a complete fellowship or unity and a, a complete agreement on all those 
points of Bible doctrine. Um, and one other thing, too, to keep in mind, and we'll see this coming up, just because a false doctrine doesn't deny that Jesus died for our sins, which we would agree is the heart and core of our faith, um, doesn't mean that it can't harm or destroy saving faith. And there's a, a, an example of that very th tragic thing happening uh, recorded for us in the Bible that we'll hear about later on. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 1, Lana. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits through teachings to see if they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Yeah, a couple of things there. First of all, notice what he says. Test the spirits or test somebody's teachings. Now, the way that that verb, do not believe every spirit, is written in the Greek language, uh, it's written, and I don't think that it's translated accurately here. Uh, when you have imperatives or commands in, in the English language, we, we basically you know, speak all of our commands in one uh, tense of the verb. It just do this. The, the Greek language can put imperatives into different tenses. The way that this is written, to me, would suggest that it would be written in a, a, a unique tense called the aorist tense. Aorist tense is not so concerned about when something happened, but that it happened, or that it happens. So do this would, would be a, 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 something, a command that would be written in the aorist. When a, <coughs> when a verb is written in the present tense in Greek, it usually denotes continuous ongoing action. Same thing is true when you put that verb into the imperative and make it a command written in the present tense. So uh, instead of just saying walk the dog, be keep walking the dog. Uh, way to do it. Um, and if you make it a negative, you wouldn't say uh, stop keep walking the dog. You just say stop walking the dog because the implication is obviously there that you, you are doing this. You need to stop it. Um, and you wouldn't say don't walk the dog. You'd be stop. And it's written, this verb here is written in the present tense. Uh, so, really, you could say, do not keep believing every spirit, or stop believing every spirit. So, these people were really not vetting these new teachers that were coming their way to see if their teachings matched with God or not. And John warns us, there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world, false teachers. Now, how do we test the teachings? Now, Acts 17, verse 11, Brad. Now that the <coughs> Bereans, Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians. Thessalonians, they received the word very eagerly and examined the scriptures every day to see if these things, what Paul was teaching them, or so you're getting all the big words tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Learning something. Yeah. Notice what they did. They didn't just say, "Okay, you, Paul, you're you're going to you're here. We're going to believe you, even though he was an apostle of God teaching the truth. He commended them because they still submitted his teachings first to what the Bible." Uh, already had written because no nothing that and no new teaching is going to contradict what was previously written and so I already put the answer to number two up according to the underlying portions of these passages God wants us to compare what religious teachers say with what the Bible says to see if they are speaking the truth again no new revelation or teaching from God will contradict what has already been revealed from God in the Bible Now, mind you, when we question a religious teacher's teachings, it should be done with a healthy dose of skepticism, not uh, cynicism. There's a difference between the two. Skepticism uh, will give somebody a fair hearing, whereas a cynic, they've already made up their mind. So, uh, giving them that respect. 1 John 1, verse 3, Shauna. 
We are proclaiming what we have seen and heard also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. Yeah, the whole point of doing this is to have that fellowship or unity. So number three, according to the bold portion of this passage, the goal of pure teaching and testing the spirits is so that they or we might have fellowship. They might have fellowship with us. My apologies, I forgot to silence my phone, but I did that. There. <coughs> Next passage, Psalm 119, 104, Sherry. From your precepts I gain understanding, therefore I hate every false road. There's a natural conclusion. When we gain that understanding from God, we're, we're not going to want to walk on the, the road of false doctrine or any false way of life or teaching. Uh, John 4, 24, Marie. God, <clears throat> God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. All right. So notice there the desire to worship in spirit <coughs> and in truth. So according, number four, to the double underlying portions of these passages, a Christian will want to belong to a church which teaches God's word correctly because we hate every wrong path and we want to worship in truth. That is our desire. <coughs> and so maybe wording that uh, last question differently, number five, when we are looking for a church to belong to, what is the most important thing to look for? Truth. There you go. Yeah, the church worships God in spirit and in truth. Now, things like friends, uh, the personality or the gifts of the pastors, the style of worship, programs or services they offer, and all those other concomitant things uh, can certainly be contributing factors in our decision, but... They have to be secondary to sound biblical doctrine. That's uh, really what God says is the litmus. Now, one thing that we should at least be aware of, while you may find a church that is um, orthodox, meaning that it teaches God's word correctly, uh, no church is going to be perfect in its uh, what's called orthopraxy, which is its practice, because we are sinners uh, in a in a fallen world, and we will always struggle uh, with with those things, with applying biblical principles in complex situations, with um, you know sin and weakness and so on. Uh, but what's important to recognize is that we express some good, healthy Christian discernment in this, um, uh, and finding a healthy balance. Like you don't want to adopt such a rigorous expectation of a church's practice, <clears throat> meaning is it following what it teaches or, or are the people being hypocrites and, you know, out getting drunk or um, not loving their neighbors? Are we going to be extremely rigid on that and zero tolerance? You, that, that's one ditch that you want to avoid. The other ditch on the other side of the road is just letting anything go, right? Um, you, you, you want to avoid those two extremes, uh, the legalistic or pharisaical approach uh, or the overly lax approach, which says, you know, this doesn't matter um, because both of those are unhealthy. Any questions on things so far? Okay. Um, getting into part four then, the need for confessions. Since we cannot know whether the people in a church have faith in their hearts or not, our testing of a church will have to be made on the basis of what a church confesses. Most churches have a written statement of what they believe and teach. These statements are called confessions. But since churches don't always practice what they preach or confess, we will also have to test a church's practice as well as its confessional statement. And again, as I uh, just mentioned there, you look at the fo footnote there and wanting to avoid those two ditches, uh, the ditch of legalism and the ditch of apathy. Um, now, sometimes people will say that they don't agree with the errors in the confession or practice of the church to which they belong. But if they continue to attend and support a false church, 
then they are holding to the confession of that church. And we'll be looking at that passage, 2 John 10 and 11, later on. Now, the Lutheran Church has a number of confessions, six of them to be exact. And we're not going to spend time in class reading them here. Uh, you'll be invited to read them as a part of the homework for next week. But just really quickly, you've got Luther's small catechism and his large catechism. The Augsburg Confession, uh, number four, the apology to the Augsburg Confession. And the word apology here, uh, not meaning, you know, oops, I'm sorry, but the classical Greek understanding, the Greek word apologia, which means defense. So it's a defense of the Augsburg Confession. The small called articles, and then last of all, the formula of conquering. Now, these were all written at the time of the Reformation and were published together in the Book of Concord in the year 1580. Since some new errors have troubled the Lutheran Church in the 1900s, our Wisconsin Synod has published a confessional tract called This We Believe. It's a little booklet that's like maybe about yay thick. It's not big at all. Uh, this tract confesses what is truth and what is error according to God's word in regard to these new matters which are troubling the church today. Um, our next passage, uh, let's see, who's up for reading? Robert? Um, I am praying not only for them, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be, a, may they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Okay, so what we learn in this passage here from John is that when we examine the confessions and the practice of another church body and we find them uh, to be in agreement with us, Jesus wants us to be united in fellowship, church fellowship with them. Maybe this is a good point here, though, just to, to briefly pause as I have in the bold type. Um, why are there so many different Christian denominations? Um, it's a question that a lot of people have, and a good question. Uh, the answer to that really lies outside the, the, the time that we have uh, together tonight. But what I'm going to be doing is I'll be sending to you an article that uh, was written a number of years ago by another pastor. His name is James Hine, very gifted and insightful individual, uh, who talks about this very thing a little bit more. Why are there all sorts of different Christian denominations? and might find it uh, quite enlightening. Uh, for part five, uh, get to know your church a little bit. Uh, I will leave you to read this on your own. This is a section that uh, gets updated periodically. You can look down in the footnote and see uh, when the, those statistics there were last updated. Um, but uh, they, they need to be updated every so often, so it doesn't pay to be going through this in a recording. That's going to be... Uh, static and not changing. But that gets us into part six, and that uh, wonderful, beautiful picture that <laughs> Shauna was uh, kind of retching over earlier. <laughs> <coughs> what happens when we welcome false teachers or false teachings into our church and life? 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, Andy message will be spread like gangrene. This includes Hymenaeus and that guy. Philetus, yep. Who have veered away from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are overturning their faith of some. Okay. So according to that italicized portion there, uh, what medical condition does Paul compare false doctrine to? Gangrene. Gangrene, yeah. <coughs> and what is gangrene? Away at your skin, right? Yep, rotting, decaying flesh. Like, <laughs> I've only seen it once in person. That was all I needed to see, and that I was not because I requested to see it. Uh, man, it was probably a few months before I moved up here. Man, at uh, my previous congregation, <coughs> uh, Leroy Pat, he was in his dying days. Uh, he had diabetes. He already had had one leg amputated a, a couple of years prior and would make the joke they already had one foot in the ground. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> you gotta give the guy credit True for story. having a sense of humor yeah. about it. That's um, right. Well, the other one was uh, becoming gangrenous, and he decided just all of a sudden unwrap the, the bandages and show me, like, oh, okay. Well, now I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't need to keep seeing that. <coughs> Pretty nasty stuff. Number two, compare the effects of gangrene to the effects of false teaching. Um, false teaching causes spiritual harm, even death. And I want you to notice in that passage that Andy just read, this is going back to what I said earlier. What was the false doctrine of Hymenaeus and Philetus? It was telling people that the resurrection had already happened. They're not attacking that Jesus died on the cross here. But this particular false doctrine was causing some to fall away from faith. Which shows you that that minimalist approach that, oh, we only need to believe that Jesus died for sins and believe in the triune God to have fellowship, it doesn't work. It's going to cause problems. Next. If you don't get rid of gangrene, what happens to it? It spreads. spreads. It spreads. And that's the answer here. False teaching, if it isn't removed, spreads through the body, the church. <coughs> Elsewhere, and not in as graphic of imagery, Jesus compares false doctrine to yeast. A little bit of yeast will spread through the whole dough. And he says that's what uh, false doctrine does. And there are churches out there where you can see that this is just an excellent, uh, where there are excellent examples of what Paul talks about here, what Jesus talked about with the yeast illustration. Um, and this gets us then into understanding a little bit more why we say that the doctrine of church fellowship is a loving doctrine. Uh, it's got a loving, a protective intent to protect us from these things. You know, yeah, maybe it's a particular false teaching doesn't result in a loss of faith. I'm not going to say that every single one does. But it is going to result in uh, misunderstandings and, and struggles in one way, shape, or form. Now getting into some of the terms that we have here. Uh, Orthodox, that is a church which is true to the Bible. Yeah, there is uh, what's called the Eastern Orthodox Church, or Greek Orthodox. Uh, they, they use that word. But the word, it's, it, it's kind of like Roman Catholic. Uh, they've taken the word Catholic on themselves. We heard last week that the word Catholic means? All universal. All universal, yep, universal. So, um, but uh, the, the Greek Orthodox Church, they've just appropriated this word into themselves just like Catholics have with the word Catholic. Uh, heterodox is a church which mixes truth and error, and most Christian churches fall into this category. Notice, there's still churches, and that's important to say. And then you have cults, non-Christian groups that appear to be Christian but reject the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. <coughs> um, there, you, you can't necessarily give one group of defining characteristics of a cult and say that they apply equally to all uh, different cults across the spectrum. But there are a, a large number of different defining characteristics of a cult, and uh, some of them they all share in common, but uh, there's others that might be particular to a, a particular group. Um, not going to get into that here. If you want to know more about those, I do have resources to share that information with you. But um, some of the perhaps better known uh, cr Christian cults, you know, I, mean, I do Christian in air quotes because they're not really Christian, would be Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormon, Latter-day Saint. And uh, we'll, we'll actually uh, learn a little bit about them coming up later on. Before we get to question number three, uh, Lana, could you read John, uh, 2 John 10 and 11? Um, that's going on page six. Yes. That one. Okay. Anyone who goes on ahead and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in his teaching has both the Father and the Son. If someone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not even wish him well. For the one who wishes him well 
therefore welcomes him into his home, shares in his wicked works. Good. So, uh, back in John's day, there were a number of these itinerant or traveling preachers who went from town to town preaching or peddling a message. Uh, some of them, like Paul, were true apostles. Uh, some were false. But whenever they entered a town, it wasn't like they just uh, stayed at the local Holiday Inn. Uh, they would depend on the hospitality of a local person to provide them with food and lodging. Uh, now, according to the underlined portion of these passages, what does John say about the person who welcomes that false teacher or false teaching into his life? In other words, saying, oh, you need a place to stay? Okay, go ahead and, and stay with me. I'll, I'll provide for you uh, while you do your work. They're just as wicked. Mm -hmm. He's sharing in or supporting his wicked work. Makes no difference if you agree with it or not. You're still supporting it. <coughs> All right, question number four. Then. Oh, give Sherry a moment to write it down. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. I need to write it down. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, question four. Earlier we heard Jesus say, May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. Because it is Jesus' expressed wish for his people to be united in fellowship. Does this mean that we should unite with Christians who hold to different teachings than we do? If Jesus is saying, Hey, all, I want all of you to be one, does that mean that we should unite regardless of teaching? No. Right. Uh, are we breaking Jesus' words? Again, no. <clears throat> and the reason for that, and I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to put up here, you can write down your own notes, is, uh, yeah, Jesus wants us to be united, but not at the expense of the truth. His word is sacrosanct, meaning it is most holy. And he doesn't want his word compromised for the sake of an outward unity uh, that doesn't have any sort of uh, genuineness or authenticity to it. So going back to <coughs> question three then, yes. how would somebody know that somebody was preaching to them in a false manner if they don't know? That is a darn good question. <laughs> and I'm going to, uh, they might not, yeah. ultimately. And it might only be through happen chance eventually that they find out. Um, there's a couple that I'm going to uh, refer back to from my previous congregation, Ed and Ida Vandermolen. Absolutely wonderful, faithful, strong Christians who came out of uh, a church where uh, false doctrine is rampant. And they were knowledgeable and educated in the Bible. They just didn't know. In the wrong way. Yeah. No, they were not educated in the right way uh, because, you know, in the old days, that uh, they, they grew up outside of that church body. So they got educated in the right way. <coughs> and, uh, well, it's a complex situation. Point being, uh, they were not aware of everything going on in their church. I'll come back to them later on uh, with, with that. So, yeah, there is a little bit of ignorance sometimes at play with, with people in these situations. And uh, we certainly want to be aware of and respect that and not say, you know, okay, it, it's not simple black and white that because you belong to this church, therefore you must believe yeah. everything that they uh, believe and teach. I know that that's not true. I mean, <coughs> has anybody ever met a Roman Catholic in America who believes every single thing that the Roman Catholic Church teaches. I haven't. Uh, not yet, anyway. I know they're out there, but in my experience, I haven't met a single one. So, um, just something for us to be aware of in yeah. that. Yeah. So, and that gets back to the whole, um, you know, what, what can't we judge, what can we judge, uh, sort of thing that we were talking about earlier. So, great question. Part seven, what is God's will for us as we practice fellowship? <coughs> and that's going to be uh, the question that we'll be answering here as well. Uh, we got John 17, those selected verses 
We're not going to read them again, but just highlighting the, the italicized parts. May they all be one, Father, uh, as you, Father, are in me and I am you. May they be completely one. And then the next passage, which we've already read, uh, that we express the same view and be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so the first answer there, uh, what is God's will for us as we practice fellowship? It's that Christians have and express perfect unity in mind and thought about everything that the Bible teaches. So our unity is not just an outward organizational unity among churches, but a complete agreement in doctrine. <coughs> Brad, next passage, Ephesians 4, 3. I promise this is an easier one. <laughs> Make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And it's short. So notice, make every effort. So not only practice this perfect unity, but make every effort to maintain that unity. How do we do that? John 8, 31. So Jesus <clears throat> said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you remain in my word, you are really my disciples. All right. <clears throat> Elsewhere, Jesus talks about how the world is going to recognize that we are his disciples. He says, by this the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So to the outside world, you know, that fruit of faith, love, will be the characteristic that they recognize and identify uh, uh, that show us to be his disciples. However, here Jesus uh, gives a, a, another standard. Uh, maybe even a more important one, uh, standard for discipleship with him. Remaining in my word. So how do we maintain that unity? By remaining in his word. And how much so? Next passage, Matthew 28. Sherry. Therefore go and gather <coughs> disciples from all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to keep all the instructions I have given you. All, right. all the instruction or teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So the next blank here is that Christians make every effort to maintain <coughs> such unity by faithfully following all of God's word. <coughs> next passage, Matthew 7, 15 and 16, Breed. Watch out for false prophets. <clears throat> they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. You do not gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, do you? How does Jesus describe false teachers here? Sheep? No, not sheep. Oh, wolves. Wolves, wolves, how? But what kind of wolf? <coughs> ravenous. They're ravenous, but also how, how do they appear? Like everybody else. Like sheep, yep, they're in sheep's clothing. They, they, they don that the appearance of a, a tame, docile animal that, at worst, is going to just headbutt you, <laughs> right? But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. In other words, that they may seem nice and innocent, but their teachings are harmful to a person's faith. Now, Looking at verse 16, how are we going to recognize false teachers? <clears throat> and I'm going to go to Andy since he brought up the passage earlier. <clears throat> Watch out for false prophets. We read that. Yeah, we read it. Just looking at verse 16, my question for you is, how are we going to recognize the false teachers? Do you, am I reading something? No, not oh, reading. Just answering, answering my question. Oh, what's your question? How are we going to recognize false teachers? How are we going to recognize them? Yeah. By their and fruits. By their fruits. Yep. That's what you, you had told us earlier. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And what is that fruit of the false teacher? False doctrine. Exactly. Their false teaching, their false doctrine. <coughs> Which means you have to have a little bit of a knowledge and understanding of what the Bible is. Uh, and says, you also will have to understand or know what their teachings are too. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people have been led astray. 
How many of you here know of Jim Jones? You remember hearing about that? Yeah, you, I'm, yeah, you would know that. You guys know? Read about it. All right. Jim Jones started a gathering, I think it was in Indian, Indianapolis. I'm not sure, though. Don't quote me on that. Uh, might have been various places. <coughs> he gained quite a following for himself, a religious following. Uh, and a lot of that was because of some of the nice external things he did, um, showing compassion for the poor, uh, for uh, the racially discriminated, etc. Well, then he led a group down to South America. Long story short, force-fed all of them cyanide-laced Kool-Aid. So the phrase, the expression, drinking the Kool-Aid, um, that's where it comes from. To many, he seemed like a wonderful guy. But had they had a good knowledge and grasp of the Bible, they would have known not so much. But then, you know, that, that's the unfortunate thing, that there are these, and sometimes people will encounter the false teacher first before <coughs> coming into contact with a good one. Well, I think they found mm -hmm. it out pretty quickly, but at uh, that time they were that many time, miles away late. from home. And yeah, support. yeah, tragic, very tragic. Uh, Romans 16, <coughs> verse 17, uh, we already had this one, but I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the teaching that you learned and keep away from them. So the last, uh, we should get uh, the third and fourth blanks together. I'm sorry, forgot to do that. Um, the third blank, that Christians recognize the presence of false teachers and false teachings in this world. And then number four, that Christians keep separate from teachers, churches, and religious organizations which go against the teaching <coughs> or teachings of God's word. <coughs> so whose idea was it to keep uh, separated church and state? Um, was it the churches or was it the... Schools? That would have been more the like the, the founding fathers. And might understand the, the expression or the phrase separation of church and state actually does not occur in any of our uh, legal documents, our founding legal documents. It's uh, somewhat inferred. It's generally a wise practice. But I think we also need to be aware that at times the church and the state, uh, there is areas of overlap. That they, meaning that they both have or, or speak about the same topic. Does the government have anything to say about murder? Yeah. Absolutely. Does the Bible have anything to say about murder? Yeah. <laughs> the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. So if you put that as a Venn diagram, you know, there's a little bit of overlap at times. Uh, but uh, generally there is, um, you know, that distinction. I think it's well made. But a um, little bit different than our topic here, I'll... I'll come to that when we get to the fourth commandment. Well, I mean, it just makes sense that <coughs> if the teachers don't know what they're teaching as, as far as religion goes, then maybe keep that to the church then, mm -hmm. and, well, and vice versa. That's true, too. That, yes. That's why I was asking. Got that. it, got it, yep. So the bold paragraph there, um, when we make the conscious decision not to join in fellowship with others, or we have to inform others that they are not permitted to join with us in things that would imply that we have fellowship with them, like taking communion with us, people may feel that they are being unfairly judged. In fact, at our circuit meeting this morning, a uh, pastor's circuit meeting, one of the pastors from up in Fargo asking about how to address this very thing because he keeps running into it. Now, they are partially right in that they are being judged, but it is not an unfair judgment. We are not judging their faith or their hearts. <coughs> we are, however, judging their teaching their confession of faith, as is given by their church membership, or their actions, or a combination of the three. So, getting back to what we heard earlier and just repeating here of what we aren't judging and what we are. Yeah. But, and, but it goes along with saying <coughs> you're really protecting them. Correct. Ultimately. Yeah. <coughs> Unfortunately, you know, they often don't see like, it that way. Like with communion. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to do that lightly. Right, or, right. you know, flippantly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, part 8, different ways to show fellowship or unity in faith. 
The doctrine of church fellowship is not something that exists in the realm of the theoretical only. There are specific ways that we can practice or demonstrate fellowship through what we do. In this section, uh, we're going to look at those ways. And so the overarching question here for us uh, in each of these boxes is, in what public activities do Christians express fellowship or unity? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Um, let's see, where are we at for readers? I'm losing track. Robert? Oh. I think it was me. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <coughs> there is one bread. We, who are, who are many, are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. All right, we already had this one um, a couple weeks ago. This is dealing with communion. So in that box, communion. We are one body because we all partake of the one bread. So that expression of fellowship, the horizontal fellowship uh, going on here in the reception of that meal. The next passage, Acts 13, 1 to 3, we're not going to read it, but basically what happened there is that uh, the Christian church at Antioch gathered together, they had a little powwow, and they said, we're going to set up, uh, the Holy Spirit said to them, set apart Barnabas and Saul, who became Paul, uh, for the work that I have uh, set for them. And so they did that, they commissioned them, and sent them off. And so the answer here is mission work. Uh, how can you be doing mission work on behalf of a group if you and that group aren't on the same page? Because you're not going to be accurately reflecting that group. <coughs> Next one, uh, there's four of them here. Acts 2, verses 42 and 46. Andrew? Uh, they continue to hold firmly. Uh, to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers day after day with one mind. They were devoted to meeting in the temple area. All right. Number of things here. First, it says that they continued to hold firmly, or literally it says that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And maybe you could understand the sense of uh, what they taught, but it also can be understood in the sense of the act of teaching. So they studied the Bible together. This is an interesting one, because I often hear about people in groups, uh, study groups across denominational lines. Uh, so back in 2012, I went on a one and done date with a young lady, a uh, nice lady, but definitely not in the cards for us uh, to work out. Uh, she grew up uh, a little ways to the north of where I was serving in Wisconsin. Uh, and she grew up Missouri Synod Lutheran. And Missouri Synod and Wells, we are identical in our teachings regarding baptism, regarding the work of the Holy Spirit. Exactly the same, no different whatsoever. Well, for a while, she had moved out east and belonged to some other uh, Christian group. I don't know what it was. But then had since moved back by her parents and I guess was resuming her Missouri Synod roots. Well, we went out on this date, and at one point on the ride back to my place, we were talking, and I, I forgot if it was about baptism or the work of the Holy Spirit, or maybe both in conjunction with each other. <coughs> but I said something, and it caught her off guard. And she's like, that's not what the Bible teaches. I'm like, yeah, it is. And... Uh, she said, that's not what I learned growing up. And I said, actually, no, I can guarantee you that's what you learned growing up. What happened? Well, what happened was her time in her Bible study groups, her, her, her church out east in the D.C. area, she began to pick up on the things that they were teaching, and it was having an impact on her beliefs. And... Uh, there's the, the caution there um, that, that she was exposed to something and it, it started working on her. And I, and I told her, go talk with your Missouri Synod pastor and he's going to tell you exactly the same thing that I'm saying uh, here. Next one. Uh, we already had communion, but notice it said to the breaking of bread. That's a reference to communion. <coughs> and then it says, and to the prayers. They prayed together. Sometimes people will 
you know, hold hands and form a prayer circle. Okay. What does a circle imply or symbolize? Unity. Unity. Yeah. I mean, it's why we wear these on our fingers, aren't, isn't it? It implies unity. Taking the most gross or obvious example, how can I pray with a Muslim who believes in a totally different God than I do? Or uh, with a Hindu who is praying to who knows how many million different gods. Uh, pick one. There, there, there's no unity there. Um, even a, let, let, Let's put it this way. Well, hang on. I'll come back to that thought in a little bit. Uh, but first of all, the last one is that they worshipped together. They were devoted to meeting in the temple area. <coughs> Second John 9.11. Uh, we already read this earlier. The passage there, the one who wishes him well, or that is, welcomes him in, shares in his wicked works. Uh, a couple of things that we can draw from that. Charitable support. Charitable support. And you could also say membership as well. The next passage, Colossians 3.16 it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So singing spiritual songs together, an expression of fellowship. <clears throat> and the last one, uh, Acts 15 we're not going to open our Bibles to this. It's a lengthy section. Basically what happened was, was there was some uh, debate about uh, what was the proper teaching in the early Christian church. And so you had uh, a, a general council of the church, the, the first council of the church that gathered together to work through and resolve that issue. And so um, when you're working together for the truth, you can solve those issues together. If you're, if you're divided, uh, you're, you're not going to be able to resolve those issues. <coughs> but in short, really, any activity that has a religious component to it must be considered an expression of worship and therefore uh, something by which we express fellowship. Uh, it's not just an external matter. Now, it's not to say that we, let's say there is something going on in society or the government that concerns a number of Christian church bodies and um, a number of churches get together to sign a petition um, and to send off to the government, like say regarding religious liberties, for example. Um, there's no implication of fellowship by signing such a document together uh, it's a, expressing a, a common concern to our government. Now, on occasion, our family and friend connections will lead us to attend a church service in a heterodox church, like the Catholic Church or non-denominational church. It might be for a wedding, a baptism, a confirmation, or a funeral. If singing and praying are expressions of fellowship, then the principles that we've learned in the doctrine of church fellowship would lead us to refrain from participating in all aspects of the service prayers, singing, public reading of scriptures, playing instruments, and so on. And even just from a practical perspective, I, I think that this is a wise thing to do. So case in point example, when my grandma died, a uh, Roman Catholic, go to the funeral. In fact, this, this is true of any Roman Catholic funeral I've been to. Um, you get done with the homily, which is the, the sermon, and then they have a prayer. At, at a certain point in that prayer, every Catholic service I've been to, they pray for the soul of the person who died. Why do they do that? If the soul is in heaven, do they need any of our prayers? 
No. If they're in hell, are any amount of praying is any amount of praying from us going to do them any good? That's exactly it. <coughs> they're implying that the soul is in purgatory, and please, Lord, spring them free from purgatory quickly to get them into heaven. But as we learned in a previous lesson, uh, there is no such place as purgatory. And so now you're praying false doctrine. And if you joined together at the start of that prayer, you didn't even realize you were doing it until you were involved in it. And that's not to say that every prayer is going to contain false doctrine. I'm not going to pretend uh, that. But it is just a, a practical example. Now what does this mean about, say, you know, I have a my, my Uncle Bob and Aunt Sherry. The, they're Missouri Synod down in southern Missouri. Am I not going to pray with them? No, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pray with them. <clears throat> and it, that, that comes into a little bit of what we're going to hear in just a moment here uh, with Christians belonging to a heterodox church and the difference in <clears throat> a weak brother or sister in the faith versus somebody who is a persistent errorist. Um, you know, you can look at somebody who might be weak. Getting back to your illustration earlier, what if a person doesn't know about the, the, the teachings of a church? Or maybe what they haven't been taught correctly, perfectly. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and presume that I have my Bible knowledge right 100% of the time either uh, and, and have such a haughty, uh, arrogant view of myself that, okay, I'm going to look down on you because you're, you're, you're not good enough to pray with me. You know, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to look at that person as a weak person in the faith, and I'll still pray with them on an individual basis. <clears throat> There's a difference between that, though, and public worship in a, in a different church setting. So just want to make that distinction clear. You can see a strong person in your faith but just not know because you don't know exactly and i would definitely uh categorize ed and ida vandermal in, in that uh prior to their uh coming over to us from their previous congregation that's how i would characterize me and the kids that's yeah. why we're here <laughs> that's why we're here <laughs> there you go so interesting story with them coming up but uh, we got some things to go through first so <clears throat> uh, Christians belonging to heterodox churches. It's easy to see how the doctrine of church fellowship would apply to non-Christians. Where this topic gets stickier, however, is in the case of various Christian denominations, especially those denominations who might align fairly close to us from a doctrinal standpoint. There are many good things that they believe. They accept many of the core doctrines of the Bible, some excel better than we do at living the godly life and loving their neighbor. Most are Christian. Yet we cannot ignore the fact that they teach or believe things that are contrary to what the Bible teaches. They mix truth with error. Although they may be Christian, the Bible also makes no distinction when it comes to the doctrine of religious fellowship. And what Paul says in Romans 16 and what John says in 2 John still applies. That's why Christian love will not permit us to join in any expression of faith with them. Love for God, appreciation for his gift of faith, and love for our Christian neighbor will compel us to make this Christian confession in love and humility, lest we give them the wrong impression that we are okay with the errors which they believe or to which they belong. We recognize that they may even be unaware of their church's teachings or unaware that their beliefs do not align with the Bible. While we don't do this because we feel we are any better, or we don't do this because we feel we are any better than they, but simply because we are following the direction God has given us. And so a little bit there at the end of what we've been discussing, Lana. Uh, weak brother versus persistent errorist. The Bible makes a distinction between those who are weak in faith and those who refuse to believe the truth even when it has been clearly and repeatedly set before them. What matters here is the attitude of the heart. There is a fundamental difference between a person who is struggling to believe the truth and someone who refuses to believe the truth. And you could be, maybe even say to a degree someone who is ignorant of the truth. 
Determining which category a Christian may fall under will go a long way in how we practice the doctrine of church fellowship. Your chance to test the spirits. Time for you to put what you have learned into practice. In 1 John 4, verse 1, we heard John's encouragement to test the spirits. What follows is a list of various real and a few hypothetical statements of belief taken directly from the confessions, writings, or websites of various teachers, churches, and religious organizations. Sprinkled in are a few correct. You can cross out the incorrect statements that uh, I've created. I, I only have uh, the correct ones in this current uh, rendition of the, the class. The source of these statements, though, is hidden so that you might test the spirits in an objective, unbiased way. Please don't misunderstand the point of this exercise. It is not meant to elevate the wells as something to be admired and looked up to. Although we are confident that our confessions of faith are clear and accurate representations of Bible doctrine, we also recognize this is true only by the grace of God. We also recognize our sinful nature and our failures to perfectly practice this doctrine. So we have nothing to boast about before the Lord except the Lord himself. This exercise is simply an opportunity for you to put into practice what you have thus far learned and to learn a bit more about the different teachings that exist among the Christian denominations with the hope that you come away from this exercise with a better understanding of some of the concerns the Wells has. So the questions here, <clears throat> can we join in religious fellowship with these? Yes or no? The first quote, it's tough to be a Christian in our world, but Jesus does not allow us to be neutral about him. He demands that we decide about him, uh, meaning that unbelievers uh, have that ability to make their decision for Jesus and come to faith in Christ. Sherry's shaking her head. Why not? Well, I mean... I agree with you. Could, I don't know. I, it just... Can an I, unbeliever, a person <laughs> who is spiritually dead in sin, as we heard previously, make a decision to uh, come to faith and believe? It, no. No, that could... That's la the work could of Lazarus the, right. raise himself. Right, exactly. That, that is the work of the Holy Spirit to bring somebody to spiritual life. Um, <clears throat> I know some of you have heard of Billy Graham. This is Billy Graham. Amazing guy who did so much for the Christian church in the 20th century. I mean, the guy brought more people to Christ than Christ himself did during his earthly ministry. Uh, <clears throat> but he always would, would talk in these terms uh, as though a person who does not have the Spirit, can accept those things that come from the Spirit of God. So for that, we would disagree with that. <coughs> Next one. Our communion table and worship services and baptisms are truly open regardless of belief or tradition. So hey, if you're a Muslim, you can come to... No. Yeah. Um, this is spoken in a newspaper article by a Reverend Susan Lester, <coughs> who belongs to the United Church of Christ. There is one divine essence which is called and which is God, eternal, without body, without party, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, visible and invisible. And yet there are three persons of the same essence and power who also are co-eternal, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So one God, but three persons, and each person equal to all the others. Yes. Yep. This is the Augsburg Confession. One of the six confessions of the Lutheran Church. When Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, he actually meant that his body and blood were present in, with, and under the bread and wine. He was not saying that the bread and wine merely represent his body and blood. Yes. Yeah. This is one that I came up with. So I'm the author of that quote. So it's no. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, no, the answer is yes. Oh. Because, <laughs> yeah, uh, we believe that it is just uh, that it is Jesus' body and blood with the bread and wine. 
When asked if unbelievers can go to heaven, uh, blank, name withheld, told the post. I don't <coughs> claim to understand who's all going to heaven. I just believe and I teach in all my messages that when you have a relationship with Christ, that's the reason why he came, to have a relationship with him that is the guarantee from heaven. People don't all believe like me. They see it bigger. I believe God's mercy is very big. I thank God I'm not the judge who gets to come. Who said that? <laughs> I'll tell you in a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe my first question, did he answer the question? Do unbelievers or can unbelievers go to heaven? Did he really answer that? No. Yeah, he, he kind of dodges the question, doesn't he? Nice in a, it, yeah, it tries to be nice and evasive in the end. He mentions nothing really about Jesus in the sense of Jesus' death for our sins. In fact, this person, when you watch him on TV, will never once refer to Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Uh, he is the poster child these days for what's called uh, social gospel or prosperity gospel. And you might already know who it is. We all know him, right? Who Joel, is it? Is it Joel Osteen. It is, yes. yes. That's what I thought. He's it so was. easy to watch. <coughs> yeah. He's but so smooth and he got that smooth he just, text and accent. Yeah, he, yeah. he says good things. Yeah. But <laughs> it's all good. Well you know it's a quote, air, right, air well, quotes. thank you, thank good. you. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's all a, a total taking out of context everything in the Bible. The guy has a book called Your Best Life Now. Um, and that if you believe in God, good things are going to happen to you is basically his message. I still remember uh, Babylon B years ago uh, with a satirical article um, when uh, one of the hurricanes hit Houston, which is where Osteen does his work, that uh, uh, said Joel Osteen... Uh, going around the streets of Houston in his yacht, handing out copies of Your Best Life Now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's a satire website, very much satire, but sometimes when satire hits a little too close to home. <laughs> yeah. Um, next one. The Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God containing all we need for salvation and for godly living. Yes, that's one that I came up with. So what was the answer to the last one? No. Yeah. The I guess I'm not one. understanding how we're supposed to be answering these. Are we supposed to be answering these? Can we join in religious fellowship with this person? Correct. Okay. Yep. And for what reason would we not be able to join in fellow worship with Joel Osteen? Because he was keeping it PC? That's um, the reason? Or not, not just because he's keeping it PC, but because he he denies the the, the teaching that... Um, those who believe in Christ will, uh, who, that, that Christ died for our sins will go to heaven. Those who don't uh, will not go to heaven, will go to hell. Okay. He, he avoids So that. because he didn't directly say that, yeah. um, and there's, he's hiding his truth. He's hiding, okay. yes. He, okay. He's hiding his truth very much so here. Okay. Can, I, can I just show, I'd like that um, picture that we saw a week or two ago of Martin Luther and the, yeah. you know, he when Martin a, Luther was yeah. preaching, it was oh, yeah. Christ and him crucified. You know, yes. That's what the people saw. Right. And you, I think you're saying that you don't see that with you don't You don't all. ever, ever, ever hear that or see that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Good, good callback reference. Uh, the next one, through the grace of God, all made by the cooperation of God, perform what is necessary for their soul's salvation. So, you need help from God, but you can do the, the things that you need to do, the good works that you need to do to get to heaven. Yes. No. <coughs> this came out of the Council of Orange in the year 529 A.D. It's an old document, but uh, Roman Catholic then. The notion of the pre-existent Son of God becoming a human being in the womb of a virgin and then returning to his heavenly home is bound up with a mythological picture of the world that clashes with our modern scientific worldview. So in other words, 
The incarnation of Christ, being conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, is a myth and did not really happen. Yeah, no. <clears throat> this comes from a dogmatics volume. Dogmatics books are books that teach Bible doctrine. Uh, written by two individuals, Broughton and Jensen. Broughton and Jensen dogmatics is used at the seminaries of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Mm -hmm. Next one. Can modern people still be expected to accept the creed, the Apostles' Creed, with its mythological elements? Therefore, the story of the descent of the Son of God to earth and his ascent into heaven cannot be taken literally. No. Again, Broughton and Jensen. E-L-C-A. On paper. I've got more from them. How are they teaching a Christian religion but they're saying this stuff? Exactly. You're not the first one to voice that thought. Hmm. Nor, if, nor had you said it, would you have been the first one to say, why do they even call themselves Lutheran? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm, I got more comments to say a little bit later on, but I'm going to hold them until we hit some more of those. <coughs> Um, baptism is not merely an outward symbol of the forgiveness Jesus gives to us through faith in him. Baptism itself actually gives to us the blessings of forgiveness, new life, and salvation. Therefore, we baptize even little infants, because even infants are in need of these things, as evidenced by the sad fact that infants can and do sometimes die. Yes. This is one that I came up with. So for Jesus to provide the ransom, he must be a perfect man, no more and no less. Further, if Jesus had been a spirit garbed in flesh, he could not really have died at man's hands. But the Bible is clear that Jesus did provide the ransom and that he was a man, not God clothed in flesh. No. It's denying that Jesus is both true God and true man. This is the Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that before Jesus came to earth, he was the Archangel Michael. Um, came to earth, died. When he rose from the dead, he got rid of his human body, uh, is what they say. Next one. He, that is Jesus, is God, eternally begotten from the nature of the Father, and he is man, born in time from the nature of his mother, fully God, fully man, with rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as to his deity, less than the Father as to his humanity. And though he is both God and man, Christ is not two persons, but one. One, not by changing the deity into flesh, but by taking the humanity into God. So, Jesus is both true God and true man. Yes. This comes from the Athanasian Creed, uh, one of those three ecumenical creeds we heard about <coughs> earlier um, in our, our lessons. Uh, this is back, I don't know, lesson uh, two, I believe. We heard about the Athanasian Creed. Next one. Um, but oh, he's, yeah. he's Holy Spirit, though, too. You can't talk about one and not the other, too. He's God, be the, yes. Tru the Holy Trinity, right? Right. Yep. Yeah, uh, the Athanasian Creed touches on both the Trinity and the, um, the human nature of Jesus. This is talking of, about the human nature, or uh, the, the two natures of Jesus, my apologies. Uh, and this is at, in the second part where it's talking about the, the two natures of Jesus. But yeah. Uh, so this, no, is, this is a yes under the <coughs> assumption that I knew the other stuff. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, the Athanasian Creed does better than any other explanation ever has at um, talking about the Trinity and explaining it to the extent that we can understand it. How can you have three individuals who are each called God and yet not three gods but one God? As we already heard, we can't. But the Athanasian Creed, I think, does a solid job of explaining uh, that very thing. 
Uh, the next one, thus the facts make clear that the Trinity is not a Bible teaching. How could the Holy Spirit, lowercase, be a person when it filled about 120 disciples at the same time? Um, obviously, no. <coughs> uh, this is Jehovah's Witnesses. So they, they deny that the Holy Spirit is God. You'll know where this one comes from next. It is absolutely necessary for salvation to submit to the Roman Pope. <laughs> no. Or darn, I'm going to hell, I guess. Because I don't. This comes from the papal bull or edict called Unum Zantum, which was written, I believe, in the year 1306 by Pope Boniface VIII. Official Roman Catholic doctrine has not been uh, rescinded to this day. Now, mind you, the Catholic Church will not emphasize it. If it comes up, they will reinterpret it from what it, uh, its original intent. Uh, but it is there in official writing. So do they not believe <coughs> in all of the Holy Spirit? Of the last, the last one? The Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah. They yeah, they, they deny that the Holy Spirit is even a personal being. It's just it's like a God's that... active force, in so, other words, like the force in Star Wars. So it's just words in the Bible that somebody put down? <coughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they, they missed the vote on the Holy Spirit. And that's why when we had the lesson on the Holy Spirit, I made uh, a point to emphasize that he is a personal being. Like, he's grieved or he says or does things. You know, an impersonal force can't have emotions uh, as a personal being does. So um, that was why I made that point earlier on. Uh, the next one has some things redacted there, uh, so that way you don't get a head start on what it is and where it's coming from. The blank retain a religious requirement for membership uh, but allow it to be made to any God or to a substitute for God. Uh, then uh, an adult ceremony for the same body says, We, the members of blank, united by a belief in God and acceptance of the blank, do dedicate ourselves to the purpose of inspiring blank with the highest ideals of character, conduct, patriotism, and service. So you can make, say you're united by a belief in God, but you can make this religious requirement for membership to any God. It kind of sounds weird, doesn't it? How can, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Hindu over here be praying to Vishnu and I'm praying to my God and we're united by a belief in God? What? No. Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts are a religious organization. What? Yeah. That blows my mind. Mm -hmm. In fact, even when I uh, contacted them maybe about 10 years ago now, just to sit, ask them, is that, is that still true? Yep, they unapologetically said, yeah, they are. And so the, the way it reads, the Girl Scouts retain a religious requirement for membership, but allow it to be made to any God or to a substitute for God. And then we, the members of the Girl Scouts of the United States of America, united by a belief in God and acceptance of the Girl Scout promise and law, do dedicate ourselves to the purpose of inspiring girls with the highest ideals of character, conduct, patriotism, and service. And I wish they would just remove that religious requirement because there have been so many good things that they've done and instilled in over the years that you don't need the religious element to it. It's a bummer. Uh, but this is also one reason why we have our Lutheran pioneers here uh, at St. Martin's uh, for this reason, to give them a good alternate uh, to this. Of course, scouting these days has kind of gone off the deep end a little bit more with uh, the whole uh, homosexuality slash transgender thing and uh, the, the troubles that those create. So they're kind of doing us a little bit of a favor there in uh, making it even more transparent that, okay, yeah, this probably isn't something that uh, is going to be beneficial for our children to be in. But all the same, there is still good that comes out of it, and I'm not going to deny that. Genesis 1 through 11 is not meant to be scientific history. There is no way that we can check the events to be sure things happen just as described. Rather, these stories were written to give answers to the religious questions the people had. So, yeah, no. Uh, answers, no. Uh, yes, Genesis 1 through 11 is 
recorded as factual history. Uh, this was written by a guy named Stephen Ringel. Um, it's Catechism Materials for 7th and 8th Grade Children, published by Augsburg Publishing House, which is the publishing arm, again, of the ELCA. So, a denial of the history of uh, the earliest history of the Bible. As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may be. In other words, you can become God. <laughs> You're like, no. Mormon. Mormon. You knew that one already, didn't you? Yeah. Had you ever heard that couplet? Uh, I've actually read the Book of Mormon quite a few times. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just to pick it apart or because you were curious? or? Uh, well, for, well, no. Just because I had some Mormons show up at my door and they handed it to me, so I read it. And then they kept coming back and I kept on like... And I haven't seen, uh, yeah, yeah, and I haven't seen them since. I, you did it to become informed about their beliefs, so that way you know how to respond. Yes. I don't know. It sounds pretty wicked to me. I don't know. <laughs> it's the same reason I've tried to read the Quran as well. It's yeah. you know, that's a tough read, but yes, it is. Um, next one in reference. This is in reference to Jesus' resurrection. These accounts are not meant to be journalistic reports of facts. No. <coughs> Uh, uh, written by Donald H. Jewell, um, again published by Augsburg Publishing House. Bria's just kind of like mind blown right now. Yes. Um, crazy. Yes. On, now I'll get into my little extra spiel. On paper, the ELCA rejects every fundamental article of faith in the Bible. On paper. And I emphasize on paper. Because, thankfully, not every church, individual congregation, or pastor does. I'm going to guess, Robert, you did not learn these sorts of things growing up. No. Grace, to my knowledge, from what I have heard, Grace and Lutheran Church of Our Redeemer, which are the two ELCA churches in town, um, do not full-on teach all these things that uh, we have I, heard. I went to uh, Mount Olive. Oh, okay, well then, yeah, you definitely, okay, yeah, never mind. No, so I never ever. <laughs> no, no, yeah, that's Missouri Synod, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Sorry, my mistake, I forgot that. You had told me that, and I forgot. I just remember that you guys have been most recently connected with Grace. Uh, but what I've heard is that they don't full-on teach all these things. However, there are plenty of others who do. Um, in my previous call uh, in Wisconsin, uh, there was, well, there are a number of, ELCA churches nearby, but one in particular in Rosendale. Uh, at the time, uh, there was a um, he left the October before I left to come here. Uh, he had been there before I got to El Dorado, though. Um, Chuck Thompson, and I'm friends with him on Facebook, but um, I still remember a conversation I had with Pastor Thompson once in the parking lot at uh, Walmart in Fond du Lac. And he said to me, and I quote, I am the black sheep of my synod. Now, synod for them, uh, more like circuit for us, where it's uh, area local congregations. Um, but he recognized that of the different pastors in the ELCA around him, he was the oddball because he was still faithful to the basic teachings of the Bible. But he knew that others weren't. And we ended up over the years having some very frank discussions about that. I, I, I rather enjoyed that with him. Uh, Ed and Ida Vandermal, they came from ELCA. Uh, it was back around 2010, beginning in 2011, I think, when they, they came over. And they, know, they knew that, well, the whole gay clergy thing, I think, was the final straw for them. But um, they could sense there were other things that were off, too. And they even, actually, they were coming from Pastor Thompson's church. But they couldn't quite pinpoint what exactly it was. And, you know, they, I, they had me over to their house, and we talked, and I shared with them uh, some of, you know, just the basics of what we're going through now. I didn't give them any specific quotes. But I, I made them aware of a particular book that I have called What's Going On Among the Lutherans. And this book is a treasure trove of primary source uh, quotes from um, all sorts of different uh, pastors and official statements of 
uh, the ELCA and the parent churches of the ELCA, because the ELCA uh, joined, uh, it was a merger of two churches in 1988. And they wanted that book. I got them a copy of that book. And I, it, in this book, small print. I mean, really small print, really packed tight into the pages. Uh, no pictures, you know, no pop-ups or whatever to, uh, to, to take up space. Uh, it's heavy, heavy, heavy reading. When I left their house and I was pulling out on the Highway 23, I still remember saying a prayer, Lord, please let this book break their hearts. In sadness for what has been going on in the ELCA. The next Sunday, they walk into church. Ida tells me she's already read like 80 pages in this thing. I'm just smokes. That's a lot of reading for this book. And she says, Pastor, this book breaks my heart. <laughs> See what you're doing, God. <laughs> <coughs> and, yeah, faithful, wonderful people had no idea what was going on. Uh, but became much more aware through that and much more appreciative of, of what we have here. So, you know, my, what I always try to remember and emphasize is that just because a person belongs to a particular church does not necessarily mean that they believe exactly what that church teaches. In fact, there are many, many in the ELCA uh, that don't believe these things, but there are a number who sadly do, and a number of pastors who teach this, and, um, it, it's obviously a danger. And, you know, you might say, okay, well, they're fine right now. Okay, but what about when the next person shows up? In fact, that church in Rosendale, um, unless if things have changed, they still don't have a pastor. And they, the, the guy left in 2020, they're three years now, because they can't find one who fits what they value and believe there. That's the struggle. So uh, th there is that danger um, of continuing to be in them. And then thus the Bible makes the encouragement uh, in Revelation to come out from them so you don't share in their sins, uh, so that you're not influenced by uh, their sins. <coughs> all right. Uh, next one. Since all people are by nature dead in sin and separated from God, they are unable to reconcile themselves to God by their own efforts and deeds. Yes. And earlier we mentioned the Wells tract called This We Believe. Uh, that's where it's coming from. Next one. Grace does not directly flow from Christ's atoning work, since Christ's death did not earn any measure of forgiveness for unbelievers, and therefore did not merit the blessings of common grace for them either. So, in other words, Jesus didn't die for the sins of all people. He only died for the sins of believers. Unbelievers, sorry, you're out of luck. Can we join in fellowship with that? No. Yeah, this comes from a guy named Wayne Grudem. And this would fall under the category of most of your Christian Reformed churches. <coughs> Not everyone, uh, from what I know, believes this. But there are those who do. Wayne, obviously, being one of them. See, that comes up against, like, years of teaching that I had in the Reformed Church. Okay. You know, the um, limited atonement. Limited atonement, yeah. Was that something that you always struggled with, personally, or? Um, not really. Okay. I mean, because I my, my background before the Reformed Church was so disjointed mm -hmm. to come into a system of theology that was logical and deep and it, it was like coming to a banquet after I'd been right. eating fast food in the car for all these years <laughs> you know out of paper bags just because it was so rich mm -hmm. you know oh, and so, I, I, I you understand know, where you're coming from yeah um, so I'm familiar with that okay. very familiar so I like in my I, I have to <coughs> I have to rationalize that statement. Yeah. I have to and you're, you're hitting it. on something, and I'm glad you're using certain words here. It, it'll help to highlight something that will uh, come out in that article that I'll be sharing. Rational, logical. In your Reformed churches, um, 
they find their roots with John Calvin. Uh, Calvinism, in fact, is what it's called. And Calvin, um, in many respects at times, elevated human reason to the, uh, being either on par with or even sitting in authority above Scripture. That everything must be able to be logically explained from a human point of view. And when the Bible said some but not others, well, John couldn't see how this would fit. And eventually he came to the conclusion that, oh, it must be that God actually did not try to save them. If he did not try to save them, he did not love them. And if he did not love them, notice where this logical line of conclusion is going, then I don't have to love them either. Have you guys ever heard of the Westboro Baptists? They're that uh, radical um, Christian group that have gone around over the last couple decades, maybe more, to uh, different military funerals and protested. You know, they'll hold up the signs, pardon my French, but the, the signs that say God hates fags. And they'll, uh, uh, you know, celebrate that your child died uh, serving a country that condones homosexual behavior. Westboro Baptists, they reached their, their theology because they followed the logical line of thought to its ultimate conclusion. Now, thankfully, not all Calvinist churches do that. Uh, but you see the slippery slope uh, when, when you start employing that human reasoning. So uh, that, that's one of the concerns. Next one, since God has elected certain individuals out of the mass of fallen humanity to receive eternal life, it follows that there must be a permanence to their salvation. Meaning, uh, once you come to faith, you can't fall away. You're locked in. No. Uh, Millard Erickson, again, this would be uh, a lot of your Christian reform background. Uh, the second coming of Christ will occur in two stages. <clears throat> the first for the purpose of catching away his saints who are prepared for the rapture before the great tribulation period. And the second at the end of the great tribulation when he shall come back with his saints to destroy the armies of the Antichrist to judge the nations of the world and to inaugurate the millennial reign. So uh, talking about multiple returns of Jesus multiple resurrections from the dead, multiple days of judgment. Um, I've seen a lot of heads shaking, no. And that, yeah, the answer is no. Uh, what this is talking about here, if you watched one of my additional videos back for Lesson 5 regarding um, a, a, a teaching that's very prevalent in a lot of your mainstream Protestant churches called dispensational premillennialism. Uh, where they believe that there's going to be this rapture of believers, that all the believers will be taken out of this world, unbelievers left behind for seven years. Then the believers will return, and Jesus will return and kick evil's butt, set up in uh, a thousand-year kingdom with Jerusalem as his capital. And, uh, yeah, um, but Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. So, um, for many reasons, we don't believe that. Anyway, this comes... Uh, this particular quote came from the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. The next one, uh, Blank has taught that each man can by himself work out his own co conception of God and thereby achieve salvation. No. No, right. Freemasonry, Masonic Lodge. Oh. <coughs> Yeah, Mas uh, Masonic Lodge is a religious group. Uh, same with your, your Eagles, your Elks. Uh, those are uh, religious organizations. Uh, Lions Club is not. I should make that clear. You know, it's, the Lions, they're okay. But <coughs> um, Masonic Lodge, uh, not so much. They are not Christian. Um, life eternal does not come by a sacrament, nor is it maintained by a sacramental substance, but by a divine person consciously revealed in us as a present redeeming, life-giving Savior. In other words, um, that in baptism in the Lord's Supper, believers do not receive the blessing of forgiveness of sins, new life, and salvation, and therefore this church does not use the sacraments. No. The Salvation Army. 
surprised that they're uh, probably might be a little surprised that they're that they're a church. Uh, I was gonna say, can they be called a church without the sacrament? That's a good question. Um, ultimately, I would still say yes, but um, you see, one of the driving forces, as I recall, with uh, <coughs> Salvation Army is that they're central to their beliefs is a very pragmatic mindset of if it works then you do it and according to their beliefs and their mission baptism and lord's supper don't work uh, whatever that means for them so they don't they don't use those and it's for this reason why um i don't ever since i found out about this uh, i don't put money into the red containers because uh, it's supporting uh, their, their work. Now, I do want to at least exercise some caution there because <clears throat> I am aware of Wells churches at times who have made use of the Salvation Army for like uh, donating clothes or food. And the reason for that is that there was no other means available to them to disseminate those items uh, to people in need. Because remember, the doctrine of church fellowship is uh, a doctrine, first and foremost, about love. Now, there's many different aspects of love, right? And uh, th there is also not just the love of a person's soul, but the love of a person's body, too. And sometimes in an imperfect world, uh, those two are going to clash with each other. And so <clears throat> what are we left with then? And in those situations, those well churches recognizing they need to get those uh, charitable contributions to the, the poor and needy have made use of the Salvation Army's centers and whatnot for distribution. Uh, this also reminds me, I should go back to the whole Girl Scout and Boy Scout thing. Nobody brought this up, and it, it totally spaced my mind. What about Girl Scout cookies? Oh, I was thinking about it. Oh, I, 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 thought, I thought you were thinking of Smart Alec. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> And believe me, I don't mind this smart Alec like that's done in a, in a fun way. Um, you can get the same thing from Walmart for cheaper. <laughs> you guys ever go to Costco? They got the uh, uh, pretzels that are covered with the, the mint chocolate chip that are the, the um, Girl Scout ones. But I'm a, I'm a fan of the Thin Mints. So, well, now I just kind of tip my hat, I guess. Yes, you can still buy the Girl Scout cookies. You can still get your Thin Mint fix. Or whatever ones you like. Uh, there, well, there's really two options: thin mints and the wrong choice. At least in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason being is this: Are you giving them charitable support, or are you paying for services? When you're when you're doing the, the cookies, it's a business transaction, right? It'd be just like, uh, well, there, there's those rumors about you know, certain businesses or companies like Procter & Gamble uh, and whatnot. And think of all the other, well, is it the Hilton or what? A uh, number of your hotels owned by the Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. Well, I guess I can't go to them because I'd be supported. No, it's a business transaction. We, we live in a world that uh, where, where there's going to be those... Um, elements or situations where <coughs> things are grouped together that we might not agree with one, but doesn't mean that we have to completely avoid the other. Um, just the reality of the world in which we live. And so, yeah, if you want to buy your Thin Mints, go right ahead. Maybe buy the Thin Mints and have a talk with them about their... Over the at the same time. <laughs> yeah, we'll kid. Maybe they at Yeah. yeah. So here, here's another one in relation. Uh, this one caught me off guard, so I, I will uh, I'll do a, a little confession here on camera. Uh, earlier this year, had a Boy Scout show up at my door asking if I wanted to buy a coupon book, and I, I tried in the moment, like, what do I do? What do I do? Okay, I bought it. In retrospect, I probably would not do the same thing again because is it really a business transaction? And I, I just I struggle to see it in that way. And there's a, a an instance in the book of Acts, somewhere around chapter 18 or so, don't quote me on the exact chapter, where uh, a bunch of people 
come to the Christian faith in Ephesus. And a lot of these people have uh, books of sorcery, all right? Well, what do they do? They don't sell those books to make a buck. Actually, they would have made a boatload of money when you find out what the cost was. They burned them because they're not going to be helpful and beneficial to others. And I find, you know, as I thought more about it, that instance probably would have applied well to my situation. But I wasn't, you know, I didn't have the, uh, the moment <coughs> to, to sit down and really think and flesh it out. So, yeah, sure, fine. Um, I think I've used almost all the Dempsey's coupons in there. Um, <laughs> there's some other, Labby's has gotten a, a two or three from us as well, so... Yeah. Okay, last one for tonight. Thank you for sticking with us here. A nonprofit ecumenical blank, uh, interreligious or interdenominational. You might be able to figure it out. To accomplish these goals, we invite people of all backgrounds, races, and religions to build houses together in partnership with families in need. Now, this organization's highest priority is to improve people's circumstances on this earth. Fuller, uh, the creator of this organization, credits Walter Rauschenbusch, who has been called the father of the social gospel movement in America, with shaping his thinking. In his book, Fuller includes the following quotation from Rauschenbusch. The non-ethical practices and beliefs in Christianity nearly all center on the winning of heaven and immortality. On the other hand, the kingdom of God can be established by nothing except righteous life and action. In his book, Fuller approvingly quotes the slogan, Doctrine Divides, Service Unites. He says, Unity comes about when people of diverse religious beliefs work together to build homes for the poor. Maybe, just maybe, God wants to use the theology of the hammer as a means to draw his divergent family closer together. An important point to note, since devotions, prayers, and dedication services are common uh, at the work sites, there's also the potential for involvement in expressions of church fellowship that are not based on agreement about what the Bible teaches. Habitat Just for humanity. Too much. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this would be no because of the, the mixture of religious beliefs that, that go on. And they are, and they do call themselves a religious group. Stinks because they do do a lot of good. Um, what was that show going back about like 17 years or so that would build homes for people? Oh, I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, know. that was so cool. Home, yeah. home Makeover. Yeah. Extreme Home Makeover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually knew one of the families that got that, and I was there for the unveiling of it. It's in a town called Dundee, Wisconsin, uh, just down the street from... Uh, where one of my friends that served as a pastor. So, yeah, I got to That's see that whole cool. thing from a distance, but I did get to see I've it. actually helped build some habitat homes before. Have you? Yeah, lots of them. Okay. Wasn't it like Jimmy Carter, or, or no, yeah, was that Jimmy his name? Carter. He was like, heck, he was like 90 years old and, and still doing some of that. Oh, yeah? Didn't President he Carter? Didn't yeah. he start it? No, he I didn't. don't know. That's See, a good I thought he no, did. no, he didn't start it. I, I think he just. I think <coughs> uh, he was just doing. Fuller was the creator of the years old. Yeah. And yeah, but for these reasons, we don't uh, participate with Habitat for Humanity. Hmm. So, what's then your opinion of the Alcoholics Anonymous group? And a lot Al of those and groups, Al-Anon, because that's you know right. decidedly there are higher a, power. Yeah, the higher power. There are you, there are some that. You know, maybe I wouldn't get entangled with, but there are others that would be all right. Um, I don't. I don't say. I don't. I don't think that they are <coughs> united by one fellowship doctrine or, or belief system. Um, you can have local different alcoholic anonymous. I know of different wealth churches who have utilized or or had alcoholic anonymous groups uh, gather at their churches. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it depends on the situation with them. Good question. Good discussion here. I'm, I'm kind of torn between do I keep this video because it's gone significantly longer than the other one uh, because there's a lot of good stuff, or uh, do I just stick with shorter? Is shorter better? I don't know. Uh,
Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> it's a mixed bag. Um, we'll close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us all. Amen. Yeah. All right, guys, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.